And then I'm doing, oops, let me do it all. Share screen. Share sound. You guys hear that? Okay. All right. And now I am going to go live. Facebook. No, go live from Zoom. Oh. I'm going live on Facebook from okay. Zoom. Right, so share the news feed. I got it, I think. Yep, next, American Poetry Museum. And we need to, when this music starts playing, we need to press mute on our mics, right? This okay. Go live. We should be live now. Okay, are we live? It looks like it. All right, happy Sunday.
All right. Happy Sunday, everybody. going all right so we have landed we had a little bit of a rocky technical start but that's all right the flow is with us and we are all here and hopefully all of you all are there on facebook live so thank you for joining us i am lisa pegram and i have the distinct honor of uh setting the table for us to sit with Terry Cross Davis and Araceli Sturme today, who are both beautiful, wonderful poets um, who have agreed to share their work and conversation with us today. So I just wanna give you a little introduction for those of you who are not familiar with these two poets or um, are just coming into this conversation. Araceli Sturme is the author of the poetry collections Teeth Kingdom, Animalia, and The Black Maria. She is also the author of the collage-based book, Changing, Changing, and with her sister collaborated on the forthcoming What Do You Know? So that will be out soon this year, due out from Enchanted Lion this spring. She curated How to Carry Water, selected poems of Lucille Clifton, and is on the editorial board of the African Poetry Book Fund. Terry Ellen Cross Davis is a poet and the author of A More Perfect Union, which just came out this February, and winner of the journal Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize. Her debut collection, Hate, won the 2017 Ohio Ohioana Book Award for Poetry. She's a Cave Canem Fellow and a member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective. She is the 2019 2020 Howard County Poetry and Literature Society Writer in Residence for Howard County, Maryland, and the Poetry Coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. So we're usually used to enjoying programming that's brought to us by Terry. Today, we actually get to enjoy Terry as a poet herself. She lives in Maryland with her husband, poet Hayes Davis, and their two children. So we're going to start out with a little poetry in conversation. So that means that the two poets are going to share two poems each. One will read and then the other will respond. And then afterwards, we will open it up for a bit of conversation. So if anyone has any questions, any impressions, anything you'd like to share with the poets, I'll be checking out the chat on the Facebook Live so that we can share their questions with you when we open up in a bit. So we are going to start with Aracelis. Thank you so much for being here. And before I also wanna just um, give a quick shout out to um, Pepe Gonzalez, Jay Jefferson and Taimor Saidi for being with us in spirit with that beautiful music that opened up, that opened up this reading. All right, Aracelis, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to get to be here um, with you, with you all, and with you two, and with you three, um, Lisa, Terry, um, and Sammy. Um, and it's really a huge honor, um, Terry, to get to read with you and to be in conversation in this way um, and to celebrate your new book. Um, so, with that in mind, I'm going to read um, two poems um, that. I'm thinking about the poems in your new book um, that are thinking about Prince. Um, and I was, these are dusky, desirous poems, I think. And so in that spirit, I'll, I'll read these too. Um, strange earth, strange that we will die into this bright blue oblivion, though the day is beautiful and later the night will also be beautiful with the noise of crickets who even as we lose and lose, make their bodies creak with desire and the dusk. And we will call these sounds the future continuous us. And this is, um, oh, if I can get this post-it, there we go. 
This is called Zook, thinking of Zook music. It's from, um, takes place in uh, um, Tompkins Square Park in the month of June. Downtown hot of traffic and people over avenues by streets, it was a Sunday and building windows wide open above summer park coagulation, vein tappers, roller skates, dog walkers to the base of basketballs. I remember a bicycle pack posse of dons and abuelos rode smooth with their boricua flags and radios strapped. And then a parked car unspooled its music, system sweetened by a tender zook of guitars and horns that rose bloomly to reach the trees, their giant bodies, torsos to torsos, as if lovers coaxing close on last call languid dance floors, never minding time, slow winding to the rise of sap, the way I've begged God before. I love it. Thank you so much, Adeselis, for, for just being here and for sharing your incredible work. Um, I'm just so excited, as always, to hear you read. Uh, so as I'm thinking about, you know, the poems you just read, I might go backwards and respond to the first one, or to the second one um, first. Uh, and there we go. And as you talked about dancing, and so this is called Slow Drag, and I think you'll hear how it's kind of responding to the last poem you read. And this is After Dancing in the Dark by Cannonball Adderley. With the leisurely tease, the saxophone ascends a soft whisper, almost too low to hear. A timbre vibrates the inner ear. Blakely's drum dances to a sigh. Tremors race down the nerves tangled rope. The spaghetti strap of her cocktail dress slips off her shoulder. Her stocking feet whisper their two-step on the carpet's short looped hush. Her dark curls spring and fall from their pent up grace sketching themselves on the nape of her neck, beckoning his fingertips or lips to follow. Her Manhattan drained, glass angled dangerously in her hand, a swollen cherry tempted to fall out and stain the night. Her husband slouches into the hollows of her neck, led there by the bare traces of her perfume, their bodies heavy with the weight of work. What feels better than this measured surrender, letting the music lead them through the well-worn paces of love, coasting on what's left of the day's energy to linger limpid and luxuriously into the slow drag. Um, I know we talked <laughs> earlier, the funny thing is like we talked earlier about, oh, I, I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that, but hearing some other things in your work, I'm switching it up. Because, uh, you know, what, does, what happens? Um, but there is something in, in also responding to a little bit of the last poem, a little bit of the first poem. Um, there's just kind of this thing about reaching out into the ether that I was kind of, I'm kind of struck on. So I, 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 I'll read this. A black woman learns Ireland's history by bus. It took a civil rights museum to lift the skirts of the maiden city of Derry. Here's where I saw her Seamus Heaney tattoo. Belfast, the stamp at the bottom of the Titanic. Here, I breathe in an industry defined by ghosts. Then it's back to you, Dublin. How I got sweet on you, I do not know. Blame that ancestor long ago. Let's hope it was consensual. But the words that crawl your streets align with my fault lines, neither of us accustomed to joy. On the road to Limerick, crumbling forts shimmer and shy away like mirages. On the river Shannon, swans play their part near King John's castle. Here, Frederick Douglass honed his pleas for justice. Shivers dart down my bare brown arms. But it's New Grange, where stacked ancient stones call my blood to rise. Two times a year, the sun flings a season's new song into a quartz cavern. Here, lifetimes were spent, bent, building temples to echo eons. At the entrance, water collects in a giant rock's hollowed hand. A wizened man whispers to me, 
dip your fingers and touch what ails you. Yeah, there's, there's something about history and weaving in the ether are the tapestry of the past, the present, and the future. And so yeah, I pass that uh, on to you. Wow, I love, I love this so much, how I feel like I'm, I can feel myself um, teetering between just wanting to be completely lost in your work and then thinking like, oh, what poem of mine might I pull? Um, but it's a, it's a, it's um, it it feels like a particularly beautiful kind of listening. Um, so thank you, thank you all. Your um, um, what you just shared about the water that that last um move towards the water um, and also something about the progression of, of the last poem that you just read, um, wondering about history and toward history um, and a relationship to a place um, as a relationship to the wondering about history. Oh gosh, I'm changing my mind. I think I'll, I'll, I'll read this one. I've, if it's all right, I'll read, it's a little longer. Can I just read one and you read? Okay. Um, where did it go? Um, so all of that in mind, this is called Abuelo Mi Muerto. And um, thinking about what you just called up in me about like being in a place and wondering. Abuelo, I've walked three nights in the last city you breathed in trying to read everything, the birds, the buildings, the rain, and still no luck which means nothing more than I am dense and far from you. Though this is your town, your Sunday walk, haberdashery, your way back home from the train and trees you passed a thousand times like a child below the gray gaze of its mothers. How could I be lost here in your jackal-mouthed murderous streets who swallowed your children, abuelo, while the church bells marked the parish an hour? The uncles and aunts strewn about like funeral carnations. Sometimes it is so hard to hear you in the outside language of crows, though my window's an open eye. Hard to understand what the hawk is spelling as it moves just so in the sky. My head is thick, but I know you are telling me something when I hear the rooster crow or the hawk there circling. Mostly it's the birds who send me looking for the lost room of your face. The last memory I have of you was in El Toro. My mother clipped your toenails off an old and naked foot while the other one slept in a basin on the floor, sluggish catfish, sleeping fish like a fisherman's catch in the bucket, alive but nearly dying. Do you remember? Do you remember this is my only proof? Memory tells me I am yours. I am yours, abuelo. If the pigeons can wear the same face in every city, the same red feet singing the same songs and so on, can't you come back, abuelo? Tell me which are the graves I should visit and clean, which river I should bring my flowers to, which of the miracles fills your marigold chest, which is the joke you loved the most, what is the name of the desert I should think? Come back in a body I can see from the window of this crowded city train. Board the train. Sit beside me for a while and tell me things. Do not let me mistake you for a shadow or a gull. And if I start to pass you on the street, abuelo, shout my name, shout it please. Tug my shirt or hair, make me turn just a moment. Send me home with a message my mother will believe. Wear a body I can see with my slowest eye. Speak a language whose words I cannot help but wear like a family feather in my black and grandfather hair. Oh, I have had this long running thing right now and I'm bringing you into the fold of it, um, that there needs to be an anthology of grandmother poems because we just have learned so much from our grandmothers and in, yeah. Uh, so I am going to go again backwards. There, there are things there. Um, this is the poem I read at my grandmother's funeral and uh, my mother requested for me to read it. And uh, I think I shared it with my grandmother. I wanna say I did. No, no. Um, but anyway, 
So I'll read this. And this is um, the goddess of the South. I'm Mama telling you the best way to rid them pimples was to wash your face with fresh morning urine. I'm there when your mama teaches you how to pick chitlins, small fingers finding bits of straw and bone under until a full bucket cooks down to one plate. I was in your mother's hand as she rounded your head as a baby, them soft spots shifting into the curve of her palm. I'm sugar, bacon soda, cornmeal, and the cast iron skillet when your great aunt shows you how to make cornbread from scratch. I'm every bite of peach cobbler you sneak, even though you're allergic to peaches. Remember how you ain't know Bessemer was Bessemer until a road trip to Atlanta bought you in shouting distance of Alabama? Or Auntie Surly's real name was Sarah Lee? How I dragged your northern tongue, taught it to linger in the soft bowels, the syrup of me thick like alaga in your mouth. I'm in every shotgun story you know. Like that time you and your sister heard that rattle when y'all was playing in the tall grass near Auntie Surly's juke joint? Mm-hmm. How matter of fact and fluid that big woman was, putting a plate of freshly fried chicken in front of y'all with one hand, grabbing her shotgun with the other, and kept it stepping. But I evolved too, baby. My young creatures keep me so fresh and so clean. I glean in the grits you pour butter and, yes, sugar, because I do as you do, my beautiful brown children. When you spread to California, Wisconsin, New York, Illinois, and Ohio, you take me with you. You make neck bones, teach your children how to work hard for such sweet little meat. You cut rabbit chunks into your oxtail soup. You house the children of this cousin, that daughter, this sister, and raise them as your own arms always extended in a net of family of blood. How I groomed you, child, let you over here. She ain't got a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. And what you get in the giddy up is what you get in the roundup. I'm always at your table. The hot sauce you want on Friday's fried fish, that hankering for smothered pork chops you get on dreary November days. I lecture you in your sleep. When a shuddering of past relatives show up, you wake knowing it's been a visitation. If you tell your mama, she gonna reach for that numbers book. I keep one of your feet planted firmly in my red clay, be it Little Rock, Pine Bluff, or Crisp County, Georgia with honeyed names like Nay, Cousin Peaches, Grease, Junebug, I keep your mind running in circles, connecting blood to family, friends, and back. Baby girl, you'll never be free of me. All the black bodies I've consumed, y'all's blood makes the soil shine. The roots of your family tree may shift, so some of the dirt falls across the Mason-Dixon line, but I will always claim you as mine, mine, mine. If you ever change your mind, about leaving, leaving me behind. And then I will go ah, with this one. You mentioned, I was like, yep, yeah, here we go, here we go. <laughs> this is where we're gonna go. And, and I couldn't agree more with what you said earlier. It's like, it's hard. It's like, I'm listening and I'm like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And then I'm like, oh, oh but here's this thread. So let me follow this thread like Ariadne in the, in the, in the maze. So I'm leaving the thread. Um, Lola visits the underworld. Lola did what Orpheus couldn't. She snatched her big sister straight from hell. Folks say the war changed sisters, man, but he wasn't no dummy before. He came from this shit, putting hands on women. The first time he hit sis, Lola was little, maybe seven, maybe six. She balled up her tiny fist and punched him in the back, called her brother's sister sorry bastards for not backing her up. There was another time he hit, and another, until the day came he put Sis in the hospital. A metal plate in her head, stitches where the knife cut. For seven days, she was a shade of herself. When she finally walked out, Lola was right there next to Sis's man. Baby Sis Betty came for backup. Four of them in the car. Ride ain't never been quieter. Sis's man dropped them home on his way to work. His heel barely left the door sill when the sisters pulled suitcases out. The bus ride north was long. Once, twice, Sis said she thought about going back. But Lola told her, Sis, don't look back. Don't ever look back. She never did. That fool Orpheus could learn something. So, there we okay. are. <laughs> there we are. The many there's. Um, OK, so I've got a couple things are humming in me. Did you, the first poem you read, um, 
for your grandmother, after your grandmother, did you say, what did the hand, I was there in the hand? Right. You know, mind, it's, I was, I was the hand that curved, because you know how when babies are born and they have those soft spots, mm -hmm. I was always taught that you take your hand and you just cup your hand around that head and you shake mm -hmm. that head. Mm -hmm. Amazing because I, you know, my birth in class is like no one else knew except one guy who was from a village in Togo. And he was like, Yeah, we do that in our village. And I was like, Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, like really. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the line is, She rounded your head as a baby, them soft spots shifting into the curve of her palm. Mm -hmm. Because that was how I grew up learning. That's how you shape a baby's head. Yeah. My mom still looks at us like when I cut my hair short, she's like, Oh, I shaped your head. She's always so proud. She's always so proud. Not that, I mean, I, I don't know that it feels particularly anything, but she's very proud of it. <laughs> um, but something about this poem that I want to share, it feels like it's holding hands with something about the um, ongoingness of your grandmother and of the mothers. Um, but it also, and it also holds hands with the last um, poem you read too. And this is called, um, my mother's line um, and thinking about who the mothers are, were, are um, in our family, um, but also who, what other people needed them to be, how they were used. Um, my mother's line. And though she was the river silt and gold, and though she was the drop of rain and just a skinny bitty dandelion of a girl, any time they needed someone to carry the pots, to catch the knife, to walk in front, it was her they put. And though she was the shriek inside her mother's bed and was the war and not supposed to be the flower. And when she laughed, she did not hide the silver and was their dog and was not free and was the man and for the man. She heard the tumbao, she still made dance. So when one foot touched ground, one foot touched air one foot for the world that was, one foot for the world that wasn't. So front, so back through the door inside the drum. And what rode her head she could not lose. And what opened her free she pressed inside. My tamarind, my mother leans, my yam astride the dark. She wrote her root into the dirt. And though, and though, and though, and though, and though. The green she was, she was a while. And um, I'll read this other poem that makes me um, think of the last poem. And also it feels really after Lucille Clifton too. Um, on living, what to do with this knowledge that our living is not guaranteed. What could she do? What does one do when the mother's mouth is gone? When the mother closes her eye, the door, but shuts girl this time out. Girl wanted words, but there was only sadness for the big and dreadful death. What could she do but swallow loss? The black and tumbleweed of those nights became her home beside her sister. They mother each other still like wolves, like any animal will do does once she's found she's been pushed or fallen out of the grave to live. They live, there is nothing left to do but live. Oh, wow, there's nothing left to do but live. And, that's, and it's so funny because I can hear that, how that talks to, to Lola visits the underworld. It was like the whole thing of you have to escape to live and just don't look back. And just, you know, that there's nothing left to do but live is like the answer to that, don't look back. You don't look back because there's nothing left to do but live. <laughs> like, and there it is. Um, so you're gonna make me go back to Hank. <laughs> That's so funny. Like I heard that green and I was like, okay, ah, we'll put that back there. And so I had to do this very quickly and then I'll, I'll go back to uh, a more perfect union. This is 16, I was green a tendril reaching for the weak sun of early spring. I wanted laughter, a male's gaze to frame a love worth believing, but I was wet, still forming. So the bustle continued, faces passing. 
I thought my want a curing, a purity that would redeem me. I was foolish in this and all things. And it's just something about that idea of being a tendril and reaching for the light. But then, oh, you were somewhere else. And I'm, I know where I wanted to go. Yeah, come up on it now. Because there's so much. I'm like, oh, there's a lot that I was thinking of just now. Um, yeah, you know what? Because there's something about, too, that there was something, too, I wanted to get to about where you were going with motherhood. And I may not remember. I may not short. Okay. Let's see. Well, yeah, let's see. Let's let's go. Let's go here. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, because there's something too about um about the the youth, about being young, being woman coming up looking for all these things for all this light to shine on you and sometimes how the hand that grabs you is too tight and 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 pulls the the root of you out too early and and there's something there's something there so I'll go with what what came to mind and we'll figure it out her 21st summer she hangs out in shadows contours must sit and slick such supple skin leaves a body teetering between infatuation and ruin, playing men with house money. A winter before, one man held her, broke her, and by summer, Lake Erie, sea breezes, handsome faced men, a bed, a boat, a girl thought she had put herself back together again. Biology honed weapons, a waist to match her age, five different belly chains. Look, ma, no bra. Look, dad, no slip. Figure so slight, she's a one-handed grip. Walk into a bar, no wallet. Only the small of her back talking, looking for a hand to guide it home. She thought she was back together again. Trusting a lover for the sake of the night, she swallows what's set out. Buttery nipple, grasshopper, Long Island iced tea. The wet ring on the empty bar winks back, ice melting indolently. Midnight comes into heat. His arms guide her to his Jeep. The sheer thrill of flight, top down quarter moon of light, speed kissed air whipping past. Maybe there is a granite cliff, a side girlfriend, slick pavement. Maybe she hits it, maybe she misses. Oh my gosh. Man. That ending, I mean, the, 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 the list, the descriptions that feel so shift, shiftful, shape shifting of the description of her, but then later that description at the end, and then it just um, drops. Um, I think if it's okay, I'll, I'll read one instead of two. Um, um, I guess this feels like, I mean, this is what resonates in me when you, I hear those poems. Um, and that last one, and um, what you said earlier, Terry, about like with, with the, that, the poem that's on the bus and in Ireland and the wandering through a place, um, it's connected to all of those things. Um, it's called Mississippi Burial on the ferry to Algiers, New Orleans. Not loose the belly after catfish, though the trombone throws a hook in your waters, makes you move under the light's heat, the horn's loud ink, now a set of arms, now a membrane of music you wear through the rooms and streets of the quarter, beneath ghosts who walk beside you telling things, their names, the color of their hair and children. They say Violet, Rebecca, Ole, Crow. Now they tell you about the water from Algiers to Canal Street, it's hundreds of feet deep. If you buried all the women standing, the killed women, kept women, women loved and unloved who lost something important to this river, Mississippi. If you buried them standing on one another's shoulders from the bottom of the silty bed, they would rise higher than the water, than the buildings. The rockets of their skin and feathers are not seen by every eye. 
but sometimes a woman will look you in the face and say the name your grandmother was called. I mean, it is possible to wear your ghosts like a face, which is to say my face has been here before. Your talk, the heart is a fist of windows and church bells from 1852. The pigeons then are the pigeons now. The cats crying hello at the window. Somewhere on a street in Algiers, my heart is breaking still, though the highway marks time, says whole days are passing. Sometimes the breaking thing is perpetual. Mother, where is your son? What will you do, husband, when your wife has been sold? Husband, what will you do when your wife has been sold for coins to a plantation owner of things, the rest of the country standing wide-eyed at the TV? And the river said, holy are the good, holy are the lovers, holy the crawfish, catfish going about their business, not taking more than they need. Genius holy, the glow of the quiet work of fish beneath the water, like prayer that slithered down in the murky guts of the river, humming with the noise of fish, fish praying all through the water, piece by piece peace and with their mouths delivering into another life the big and drowning cities of women and land say sing me a song when you cross this river and let that song be a burial song if it is true how they say it that we only pass on once then I will wait here in the river for my burial song make it be a good song something that will help me to get up and cross over to the other side Make it be a good song and dress it with feathers and beads. Make it last a thousand years and come and sing to me, you all, one by one. So my death life lasts longer than my living one. I want to be the one with the longest funeral. Let the song you sing be a burial song. Fill it, please, with horns and shells. Let it go on for days and days so that my burial song lasts longer than my living one. You, you, you read of a burial song that will last longer than your living one. I will read you about how we often sing back up to this country and the tale that it tells, and yet it wreaks such havoc on our bodies. Um, this is called Back Up, an Ode to Weathering for Arlene Geronimus, who came up with the term of weathering about how internally Black women's bodies hold so much stress and so much destruction from living in stressful situations that we age seven times faster than white women internally. Back up and ode to weathering. Mixed ancestral and everyday trauma, African call, American response. Drum it on tight tendons, skin suffused and shiny, soft tissue singing of soreness, observing it like a holiday. It's just Tuesday. Speed it up 7.5 times. Let blood pressure reach the high notes, diabetes the low ones. Let obesity morbidly thump the bass lines while glycogen's fight or flight hit the hi-hat. Isn't each day, each step outside in America a scream? Listen to the resounding soundtrack. You don't belong here. Go back to Africa and that original hit, nigger, always number one with a bullet. When the school's white gay singles out your son, implore adrenaline and cortisol to slow their ragged runs. When applying for a mortgage with a lower interest rate, after the next white businessman lets the door slam in your face, tell this body not to hum its fate. Fear, anxiety, and chronic depression, the constant refrain, inflammation as the blood rushes to the mic again and again. Measure one, discrimination, maternal mortality. Measure two, heart disease, social economic conditions. Tune up the fibroids, open up the throat, dig down, hold that note. Black women know how to sing back up, our pain always in perfect pitch. So I don't know, I kind of like the one-to-one. -one. So let's go back, let's go back. What, what else, what else, guys? <laughs> let's go. Oh gosh, man. Um, I'm listening, I'm listening. One of the things, um, hearing you read that poem, it's so, I mean, I, I'm hearing Miss Lucille Clifton again, 
um, which is in my ear in the poem that I read earlier about you live, you live, and and how you talk about that as the other side of your oh, your Arachne poem. What's the title again? What, I'm trying to think. Oh, the, the turn your back on the city. I mean, oh, like. Oh, don't go back. Oh, Lola visits the underworld. Lola visits the underworld. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about one of the, the poem and the poem that you just read, which is like incredible and um, incredible. Um, the, the sound of it, like despite what the, is being named, the sound of it is so alive and like energetic and um, which feels like a, like a, um, a refusal. Um, okay, let's see. Man, okay, I think this one. And when we woke, it rained all night, it did not rain. I strapped my life to a buoy and sent it out and was hoping for a city whose people sing from their windows or rooftops about the beauty of their children and their children's eyes and the color of the fields when it is dusk, and was hoping for a city as free as the rain whose people roam wherever they want, free as any real free thing is free, joyful, green, and was hoping for a city of 100 old women whose bones are thick and big in their worker hands, beautiful as old doors. And when we woke, dear listener, we'd landed in a city of 100 old women telling their daughters things, and when we turned to walk away because we did not think we were, we were the people of this strange and holy place, you and I, the hundred old women said, no, no, you are one of us. We are your mothers. You too come and listen to our secrets. We are telling every person with a face. And they stood us in a line facing the sea because that is the direction we came from. And behind us, there was another line of women and another, and we sang songs and we filled the songs with our mother's names. And we filled the songs with trees for our mothers to stand under and good water for our mothers to drink. And we filled the songs with beds for our mothers to lay down in and rest. We filled the songs with rest and good food for our mothers to eat. We made them a place in our singing and we faced the sea. We are still making them a place in our singing. Do you understand? We make them a place where they can walk freely, untouched by knives or the police who patrol the borders of countries like little and fake hatred gods who patrol the land, though the land says, I go on and on so far you lose your eye on me. We make our mothers a place in our singing and our place does not have a flag or even one language. Do you understand? We sing like this for days, standing in lines and lines facing the sea. The sea knows what to do. We sing like this for days until our throats are torn with singing. Do you understand? We must build houses for our mothers in our poems. I am not sure, but think this is my wisest song. We must build houses for our mothers in our poems. That is just, oh my gosh. Oh, and there's just, as, as you're reading and I'm thinking, why can't we go to a place that has that space for us? Like where is a place that exists that has that space? And I thought, of, and it made me think about travel. It made me, and, and I love the colors. There was such a lushness in everything you described in that poem. So, it's funny if you could insert a poem that responds not to the front of your poem, but behind your poem, if this makes sense. Like, so this is a black woman gets a window seat on Aer Lingus. And, you know, everybody knows Aer Lingus has like the most popular airline in and out of Ireland. Enough Ireland for all your lush effusion of color inside me blooms a masochistic loneliness. Give me the screws I know best. The policeman quick to test my, yes, sir, as acidless, trigger the Midwest. Never on the Bible school test was this. Crucifixion kills, not nails into feet or wrists, but the weight borne upon the breast. You suffocate slowly in your own flesh. 
As I return to the upright cross of the US, I breathe easier, I breathe less. So I know that's a short one. <laughs> so I'm sorry to hit you with a short one, but it just, you, I could, there was talk of breath, there was talk of space to breathe, there was talk of policemen, there's talk of a lushness, there's talk of, of water. And I just thought about the crossing of me as a black person from America across the, across the Atlantic and then back and then wondering why I was rushing to get back across the Atlantic to take mm -hmm. the journey that my ancestors had been forced to take. And why was I rushing back to a place that did not really love me and did not really want me. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that's, and so mm -hmm. I, that's why I say it's like that poem goes behind the, like, because you were talking mm -hmm. about a place that we can build that wants us, that loves us, that engages and adores us. And I want that place. And mm -hmm. I wish that we could live in a poem because I would live in your last poem. I would live there with mm. my and it would be a beautiful place. So I hate to hit you with a short that, poem, but no, yeah. no, no, that's a me. I mean, that's the, that's such a powerful thing you just said to me, but I'm also um, um, thinking about that rhyme, breast and US, like towards the middle of the poem, you say something in breast and then back to the US, but that, that like, when you said it, I was like, oh, oh, like that, like that, my, my feeling of like the U.S. as a kind of entity, of course, not the specifics of the people and places I love, but the entity of the United States, like to have that match in a rhyme with breast feels um, such like such a potent, um, terrible, frightening, um, impossible rhyme, right? Like that feels like the crux, like the thing that you want to like suckle on is, is, you know, it is this. Um, do you, I do you want to read another one? I'm greedy. <laughs> I suppose I can. Let me see. Um, I'm just going to say that we're all greedy. So <laughs> please, by all means, it's only 356. So we want to get as many poems as possible as, as, as we can. So please feel free. This is beautiful. I, I will, um, let me think about, well, one of the things that, that, that happens so much with um, thinking about this country is it unleashes so much fury and anger I have because it should be my home by all rights. <laughs> it should be my home. And where else can I go? Um, you know, having been to other places in the world and recognizing that I am an American and that supersedes so much, um, but I just don't get to be American here. I, I have to only be black um, and I love my blackness. So I, I hate that America makes me have to choose sometimes. So I'll say if that, if that's, oh, you know what? I was gonna read the goddess anger, but I'm gonna switch back and go back to, uh, to hate because there was a poem that I did flag and it was Southern Cross because I was I was hearing in your earlier work and um, just thinking there's something about the the night that you mentioned earlier and it caught me um, like a snag in a cloth you know like I, I was caught I was like oh it's something about the night so Southern Cross from within the guarded colonial gates of our Kililashua living quarters Malcolm the Scottish intern and I spiced our secured boarding by overturning courtyard benches, piling and scaling them like vines to the roof. Tilting our heads, we soak up the velvet night, awash in silence so darkly foreign and complete with its glimmering configurations only seen south of the equator. Growing up in Little Rock, my mama told me of her night sky, of following stars paths with one brown finger. Growing up in Cleveland, the city's northern lights drowned out the Big Dipper, Cassiopeia, Orion's Belt. But across the world in Kenya, I can see the Milky Way, the Southern Cross, and I am insourcelled by the night's dictation, such incandescent writing on the blackest of sheets. So that was like responding to your earlier poem. And I was like, there's something about the night. So. Oh, I love that. And the, the incandescence and the darkness, um, so beautiful, so beautiful. Um, I'm gonna read, this one is clear. Um, I'll read a, 
a short poem that I'm working on. And then I'll read another poem. Um, where did it go? Oh, here it is. I'm working on it. But um, it's a poem to fit into a palm, though like light, I cannot catch it. When there is nearly nothing left of light and they are finally asleep in the sleep that is beginning and green, there it is again in the green. Their first deep breaths take me into what sighs there and myself also until my son up from his silt wakes me up from my own for the water he is thirsty for. And I cross through to open the faucet, cross back. And while he drinks, see the water in his glass now catching the old little light crossing this room where finally it finishes. But just before, for a second, smaller than a second, this light touches his pupils, flashes in his glass, is briefly known to him, and I am it. And then I'll read this poem called um, Night for Abwe Kalepa, who's um, my, what's my grandfather's um, brother. And um, it takes place in Adisogdo, which is on my dad's side, um, the village that my grandfather comes from. Night, loose of its blue skin, scattered with goats, black and white across its dark flat fields, beside the kitchen singing with fires not enormous as the kerosene stoves skirt the kettles in flames. There will be this night, this night sung to by the ox, who in my sleep is extraordinary sound. On the edge of this town, my aboy sleeps in a dirt room beneath the dirt, the candles dim and the light. I am not far, not far from that cemetery starred with his teeth. Compass blood, Push me out of bed to pass small houses of my cousins who breathe as their children dream together on this, our land, spelled with the blood of mothers and uncles. Ah boy, tonight, I cannot tell you from the dirt or the stone in my shoe that rolls beneath me like a trick. If I stand in the middle of this red and crumbling road as the wind blows against me in the open air, my prayer, is for some small piece of my body to fall and fall away. Again, my dark will be untellable from yours. Thinking of the darkness, the night, the night. Thinking, um, okay, I, I'm just gonna jump right in because I know where we are. So this first one is called co-sleeping. Years from now, when they are teens, out studying the art of lying, I am told I will treasure this imperfect sleep. Two and four-year-old feet in my back and stomach, soft bodies fattened by my milk, such slight impressions they make on a queen-size mattress. My weight, a well, sinks them closer. I breathe in the stupor of their sweet rot breath. My children are alive. I taste the words, lull them in my mouth like a chewed pacifier, each petite exhalation secure knowledge. I swaddle this fact, fold it tight, tuck in its edges, wrap it again, alive, in this moment, on this night. I burrow in, knowing sleep won't come, but curl around them, a shield, settled and still. And I'm gonna go to, uh, where is it, where is it? This part of sequitur, okay. And then just thinking about like tiptoe, there's, there's so much, there was so much you read that just touched me. And I just, I'm like, that's, I was like, oh, here, let's just stay here. Let's stay here in night. Let's stay here in, in the beauty of the night, but also fear of the night. Let's stay here in, in the family that we have in the night and the, and the family that we love in the day. Let's just stay here. So part of sequitur ventrum, and it has an epigraph or epithang, as Miss Lucille like to call it, a Latin phrase that stands for the principle that the children of an enslaved woman are themselves born as slaves and owned by their mother's master. One morning, his knobby six-year-old knees, his anxious pace as if to keep step with the question steady overflow. Is there a giant octopus in the Bermuda Triangle? 
How is paper made? How do fireworks know when to explode? No one told me black boys could burn so bright. Wait, I am wrong. The dark sky has seen their fire snuffed by white hoods, malevolent blue eyes and bluer uniforms. White women's screams all have been matched to their tender wood. So I hug my son tight, kiss the curl crop so close it's straight. My mother eye insatiable. He is dessert and I'll always have seconds. Each morning I lick my thumb, clean him up good, wishing in vain the amniotic sac had dried to armor. Two, night. His lisp, loose, syrupy, sweet, sneaks into my ear. Feel its heat, small source, more flicker than flame, flanked by arm still dreaming of muscle. He claims my squishy stomach the best pillow. If the security of our locked arms could extend beyond growth spurts, clocks, calendars, to the someone interviewing him, to the someone following him in the store, to the someone holding my son's life in trembling fingers poised above a phone's keypads. Let my love be a note safety pinned to his chest. Send him back alive, unharmed. As a black mother in America, I know my wells are birthright, pinned with iron, pinned in ink. Oh my God, those two poems. Wow, that from the title to the from part of secular adventure to the the, the list. I would I mean that as those two together, it's just like um, the gap that that should be between those two, right? Um, it's just those two poems are incredible. Um, thank you. Um, I'll read um, one poem that's a little longer. Um, and it's the end of a cycle um, called The Black Maria. Um, and thinking about um, um, birth and um, black motherhood um, and how much it takes to bring a life into the world to sustain a life and um, how unfathomable it is to me that it can just be taken. Um, eight, how did it happen? The boy, the cops, my body in this poem, the body bearing something ordinary as light opens, as in a room somewhere the friend opens in poppy, in flame, burns and bears the child out. When I did, it was the hours and hours of breaking, the bucking of it all, the push and head not moving, not an inch until when he flew from me, it was the night who came flying through me with all its hair, the immense terror of his face and noise. I heard the stranger and my brain without looking vowed a love him vow, his struggling merely to be, split me down with the ax to two, how true the thinness of our hovering between the realms of here, not here. The fight first to open, then to breathe, and then to close. Each of us entering the world and entering the world like this. Soft, unlikely. Then the idiosyncratic minds and verbs. Beloveds. Making your ways to and away from us always across the centuries, inside the vastness of the galaxy, how improbable it is that this iteration of you or you or me might come to be at all. Body of fear, body of laughing, and even last a second. This fact should make us fall all to our knees with awe, the beauty of it against these odds the stacks and stacks of near misses and slimmest chances that birthed one ancestor into the next and next. Profound, unspeakable cruelty who counters this, who does not see. And so to tenderness, I add my action. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, <sighs> okay. 
that's just that was just to tenderness i am there's so much there and then i'm like i felt i heard a, a, something that sound, oh my god and i'm trying to go back and find it in in my brain but oh my god sls that was just beautiful that was just really beautiful um okay yeah that was just really beautiful crescendo my son nest pawing each pillow like a breast fleshed out and so newly forgotten i spanked him once tonight he takes turns laughing then crying defiant then hungry in his mouth my name all the need pursed lips plead mommy and i am guilty of the same sin i miss his curled and tucked weight embryo the deepest root yanked clean this is why babies are born crying into this world having held fast to such an intimate tether who willingly would let go again but today another white cop walked free another black body was still on the ground not indicted undoubtedly the future outcome four years ago i crossed labor's red sea of pain to birth a boy no doctor hit his backside now I raise my hand to complete an act older than me, breaking the black back of the boy to make a man who can survive in America. Mommy, he calls me, and my teeth threaten to weep old milk at our stasis, both of us needing to suck our asleep, both of us fighting, him to keep me near, me punishing him to be left alone. He crawls into my lap, his heart is three, his body a lanky four. I cover him with a blanket too thin to mean it. We rock on the edge of his bed, listening to the symphony's fourth movement, the crescendo sweet, full of tension, violin strings singing. I think Mozart must have known something of loving with such a tender fear that it breaks you open like a welt that bleeds to heal. Tonight I give up, cuddling this boy so full of belief in himself. I'm too tired with love to beat it out of him. So I'll, I'll, I'll move it back to you because that was a longer one. So I would love to, I'm just, I'm just blown away right now. Um, can we do one more um, back and forth and then open up for conversation? Um, I'm going to uh, shift the course, right? So we've set the table and make sure that we shift the course because otherwise we will never get to the end of this meal because I could just keep stuffing myself with these poems. Thank you so much. So yes, let's do do one more trade. And are you all, we talked about the our Prince couplet in the end. Are you all interested in doing that? Yeah, maybe one poem inspired by Prince at the end. Okay, so let's do one more um, you know, trade of poems and then we'll do that couplet and then we'll open it up for discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's see. Um, um, this, yeah, I'll, I'll read this one, um, which is called The Woodlice Fourth Estrangement. I, I'm thinking about the hand and the spanking and this, in this case, um, a kind of, um, psychological spanking or something of, of um, my younger sister. And the wood lice are roly polies, um, the little bugs. The wood lice, fourth estrangement. The beauty of one sister who loved them so, she smuggled the wood lice into her pockets and then into the house after a day's work of digging in the yard. And after the older ones of us had fed her and washed, she carried them into the bed with her to mother them so that they would have two blankets and be warm for this is what she knew of love. And the beloveds emerged one by one from their defenses, unfolding themselves across the bed's white sheet like they did over 400 years ago, carried from that other moonlight accidentally or by children into the ship's dark hold slowly adapting to the new rooms of cloths, then fields. And we, the elders to that sister, we having seen strangers in our house before, we being older, being more ugly and afraid, we began then to teach her the lessons of dirt and fear. Oh, the lessons of dirt and fear, oh my gosh. Um... I can't, I'm going to have to pull a, a new poem that is like, 
new new let's see if i can get there fast enough we like are I, so lucky that you have both shared pieces that are in that are in process that is the power of an organic trade of poems <laughs> as opposed to a set list right yeah it's happening in conversation it's beautiful um and i'm like and it's it's still it's still a work in progress when i get to it so i'm just gonna just put that out there um let's see if i can get to it uh, not that one, not that one. I may not be able to get to a few people. So. Well, why don't you well, take a second and I will just, while you're looking, Terry, okay. um, I will share, I'll take this time now to share that the links for both Terry and Araceli's books are in the, in the chat. So if you know when you um, are ready to make sure that you have these amazing writers on your shelf, you can just um, click the links in the chat and I'd say, I always say grab two so that you have one for yourself and you have one to share because it's the type of work that makes for a wonderful, a wonderful gift and we should spread the word. And um, we are going to open up for um, a Q&A in just a moment. So if you have um, any questions that you'd like to ask of the writers, please uh, pop them in the chat um, as we round out the reading and um, so we can make sure to include them in the conversation when we open it up. Okay. Yeah. So I cannot, and thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Lisa, for that. But I, I still can't find the poem. That's, that's the stuff I would like these new poems on a laptop. I'm like, oh, where did I say that? So what I will do is um, I'll read a different poem, but I, I'll, I'll make that early segue to Prince. Is what I might do. I'm still on that fear though. Okay, like, well, oh. let's do that. Let's just, let's get to our couplet. So as you pull that up, um, for those who aren't aware, this week was the anniversary of the pre of the passing of his royal badness. Yes. And so um, as Terry, oh, yeah. as yes, I got my little, I got my little oh, amethyst, oh, little purple popping oh, over oh. here. There's my two. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Terry has on uh, purple eyeshadow and purple lipstick too, I see. Um, but then there's so much beauty and sensuality in all of the poetry that's been read today, right? Which is certainly um, the, and, and, and truth, which is certainly the embodiment of Prince. So, and since there is, is a whole uh, clutch of poems um, inspired by Prince and Terry's book, and we're, and we're cel and we are, we are in this moment of celebrating his life, we thought we would close out the reading um, with what we're calling our Prince couplet. So each of our poets have chosen a poem to share with, uh, with Prince in mind. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I am. All right. I will just say though, you know, it's gonna haunt me <laughs> at So I'm gonna be thinking about that last poem you read in the dirt and teaching her how to, how to fear. And I'm like, so watch, I'll just end up writing something. <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is the goddess of idolatry, uh, one of the goddess poems I put in A More Perfect Union. And this has an epigraph from Romeo and Juliet. It's Juliet saying, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry, um, which would be something I would imagine I definitely could have said to Prince at any point in time. Um, you know, <laughs> um, And I should just let you know that this has, I think, something over 20 something references to either Prince songs Acolytes of Prince, just like they're just a lot of Prince type references. So, uh, the goddess of idolatry, one, and I should mention too, it's in seven, seven parts, um, with a little extra called gold. So, you know, Prince liked the seven, all seven, and we'll watch them fall. Um, so, so there you go, one, go to him, bear, he loves these noon rendezvous, two. Encant the lyrics to when two are in love, cultivate lightning strikes between your thighs. Three, be his Gemini, find your Camille, let Shakadelica make you squeal, let him plead and twirl his way into your pants, court heartbreak for just one night with his face, purple electricity, flowers littered on a white floor, do it in the limousine, tonight live the fantasy, bubble bath, pants on. Four, Purify yourself in Lake Minnetonka. Be his center without care. Invoke erotic city. Make it come alive. Taste his hot flash of animal lust. Fingers dipping up and down, in and out around your lake. Become delirious. Bring pandemonium. And since gigolos get lonely too, 
Make yourself free for a couple of hours, maybe the next seven years. Always be in his hair. Five, every Friday night, his music is his body. In remembrance of him, take it inside you. Six, make your love shout. Seven, April, let the rain come. 17 days, 17 long nights. Gold, dig the pitcher, purple tulips and lilacs wilting after a tempest, then drink the overflow. Beautiful, oh man. Thank you, Terry. Man, um, this is, I want to say, <laughs> this is the poem I think of to share with you all, but it's a strange connection. It's a strange connection. So I want to say, I do know that. I do realize that. But is um, Prince not the Prince of Strange Relationships? I, also? Makes, makes, <laughs> right? yes, exactly. I mean, you know, what's the strange relationship? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Yes. Okay. I, I, I thought you, you'd understand. Okay. So um, thinking about flies, um, there's motorcycles outside. So I'll... See how they wear black and blue to the funeral, how they crawl and how they fly, touching what is dead with the smallness of their hands and feet, a beautiful theory of arches in their wings. How they carry pieces of the uncle to the stones and sprinkle our bread with the city's milk and skin. No one loves the flies, their work, their rearranging, marking us with the light of other guests. Religious world, if there are angels, they are flies who hover over our privacies, kissing us with mouths that have kissed other wounds. The sound literally just stopped. It just stopped as soon as I ended. <laughs> but you were just reading a poem that you chose when we were talking about Prince and then there were motorcycles outside. Are you serious? <laughs> and now right? there's purple rain. It's raining and you're purple. Purple rain with your purple sweater. I mean, indeed, yeah. the, the, the spirit is in the space. Yes. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Thank you both so much for being so generous with your work and, and being so open um, to exchange with each other in this way. I mean, this has been not only obviously excellent as far as creativity, but a very intimate conversation um, that you've been willing to share with us. So thank you, thank you so much for that. I feel like it's Sunday, so I feel like I'm unchurched now. Now I just gotta go make a roast or something. <laughs> um, and I want, I want to start out by, I mean, obviously we have this incredible meditation on motherhood that has happened um, throughout this conversation. And you've shared so much, so many different, this has been kind of like a, a, a kaleidoscope of mother, motherhood. So I would love to ask you all about, we've seen the product in these poems, but the nexus of your identity as, as a creator of art, but also as a creator of, of life, right? You're both mothers. And so um, if you could share a little bit about the juxtaposition of those two creative processes. I was talking to a friend um, who was a new parent and is a writer and was sharing with me um, some regrets about not being able to get to the page as often because they were engaged in the process as my friend Enzo talking about the process of parenting and how it has shifted their, you know, the ability to be able to get to the page. And my, my first instinct was to say, but you are engaged in a creative process in parenting, right? So I'm curious because you, 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 you balance the harmony of these two incredibly, the alchemy of these two creative processes. I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear a, a bit about your creative process as both artist and writer and how they inform each other. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump in there first to say, I think symbolically, I didn't begin to write again um, until I, after I weaned my second child. And it was like weaning my second child. It was like literally everything that was flowing out of me stopped flowing out of me and could then begin to pull up again and become a resource I could dip into. And, but 
and that said, you know, yeah, because there's so much sleep deprivation in those first like two to four years. <laughs> I know you know. <laughs> it's so much sleep deprivation. And it's so hard to write when you're sleep deprived. But um, at the same time, they have made me rethink idioms. Like I told my daughter at once when she was little, watch her hand, and she literally put it up. And I was like, what? Um, and I was like, oh, idiom. Um, let me explain that. Uh, but they they make me, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. And that's why it becomes a cliche. They make you look at the world anew. They make you look at a different world. They make you see the world for all its, its, its you know, raggediness and for all its beauty um, and all the ways in which you immediately want to seam it up and, and, and sew it up and make it nice and, and pretty for your young things. And so it's a balance for sure, but it was one I only begin to figure out a little later as they got older. And I think it's important as artists and parents to show our children how to feed all sides of ourselves so that they grow up to learn that they too can do the same thing, that you can, you can have something that feeds your passion and you can have, and, and you need to recognize that that's important to have and to make space for it if it's something you love. Yeah, I um, I was gonna say that there's, um, I love, I mean, what you're sharing about the watch your hand and all of those kinds of moments and the and the questions that your son had, you know, like just this morning I was like, what, um, my my son said um, he's five, he's about to be six, but I was trying to open um, like the top off of this like elderberry something, and I was trying to peel it off, and he just came and he was like do you want me to get you some scissors or do you want some extra polar bear strength? And like for a second, I, I was just like, no, I think I've got it. And then I was like, where would I get that extra polar bear? Like I just, you know, like the, these, the ways that they just, the surprise is um, something that I feel is really special um, um, and a gift. And I, um, I feel like so much of what I read poems for is like how, like the honesty the surprise, the leaping. I feel like that's how kids are. Kids are, and some elders, like of just like the truth, 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 and like changing directions. If like, my partner's um, grandfather, who I never met, would, um, when he got bored in the middle of a conversation, you'd be talking to him, everyone says, and he'd just start whistling. But like that kind of like just, um, but I think part of what's been, um, um, surprising and hard for me is how um, I'm thinking of your poem, Terry, about this thinking, like the different ways that I can feel myself, especially this last year where work requires so much and we're on Zoom with remote learning and just the kind of like the engine of capitalism and what it asks of us, I can feel it in myself so that I'm like hurrying my kids along. I'm like, um, impatient. I can, and so I, I feel like I'm, it's been interesting these last few years since they've been born and especially as they're getting a little bit older to kind of, to feel um, the things that I, like the ugliness that I don't want to teach, to feel it swelling up inside of me and having to kind of um, face that and reckon with it. Um, that's, that's been the, I don't know why it's a surprise, but I guess there are some things you feel you're at peace with. I, I, I'm like, oh, I know this. These are my ethics. This is my principles. And then suddenly, um, you're faced with a new dimension of yourself, and um, which I which I think will come through the poems, probably at some point. Um, but that feels like the poem of life, which is just like trying to look hard at it and ask questions. You know. If I can just just. What you said, Aristotle, it's like, hey, yeah, I just wanted to come back. The surprise of language in their mouths, it makes you look at language anew, right? And then, too, I feel like if you're doing parenting the right way, it should be a reckoning, right? It, you should, there should be a reckoning where you're wondering what to keep from what you learned and what to make anew. So, that's it. That's a really, of course, because we're in the flow, that's a, that's a great segue into my next question. You're talking about reckoning. And we are, um, we're existing in an era of reckoning right now. And um, this week, um, 
you know, we received the verdict from the George Floyd trial. Um, I actually spent that evening in the reading with Araceli and Sister Sonia Sanchez and Rachel Eliza Griffiths, which was a balm and, and a beautiful synchronicity that that reading happened on that day. But in the context of reckoning, what I find so powerful is that particularly with the racial violence that we're processing, there is this direct connection back to, to black motherhood in the midst of all of this. And so I'm curious how moving through this space and time um, has impacted you both as black mothers and as, as creatives. Just, I'm, I, I just like to ask about anything you'd like to share about how it has been to navigate this in space, this space and time as you, as you embody both of those roles. I can jump in really quickly just to say um, that you know, that night with Sister Sonia Sanchez, um, I mean, I was, I had my tissues there. I was, I was ready. I just was ready to hear her and knew what that hearing could, could, would, would mean to me. Um, and I say that to say, um, I, since my kids were born, I feel like I've been struggling to kind of nourish my imagination. Um, I, I've, I've felt, and I've shared this a couple times before where I felt um, like, oh gosh, I know what history is. I'm thinking of Baldwin. I know what they have done to my brother. I know what history is. And I've got these babies and I'm looking at them knowing what a baby is and what history is. Um, and I, I was like fixating on the terror of it all and um, found that reading poems, reading, I'm thinking about Jennifer Morgan's Laboring Women where she talks about the um, Virginia slave code law and like the reproductive lives of black women and racialization of this country, which is such a brutal reading, but there are these, the, and black women have survived and survived and survived um, or tried to and have had imaginative strategies for surviving. And so I've, I've what has surprised me is, um, which is again, like it feels like an obvious thing, which is, but, but it's that, um, I can turn to poems, I can turn to the stories of my mother and my elders. And even though they're situated in a lot of difficulty, I can, I can find that gre the greenness of them and feed myself, so then feed my children. And the extent to which that, that, that's been true and that, that's been, that I found that in poetry has kind of, it's kind of shocked me actually, that I'm like, that it's helping me to be present and raise my children actually. You know. As as you were saying that, Aracelis, I was thinking about gardening and how when I would try and grow something from seed, how you had to put it outside to harden it and get it used to the environment so it could thrive. And I feel like that is so much of what parenting a black child in America is in so many ways. And it's like it's so tough because it's like, I'd rather they be innocent longer and just fatten themselves off of innocence, but I can't afford that. That's a luxury. Innocence is a luxury I can't afford to give them. Um, I have to give them the tools they need to survive in this country that, you know, this Janice face country. Um, you know, so I, I um, and I just think about like, it's, it, it has, mothering has given me so much, it's given me so much reflection is giving me such a hunger for ancestral knowledge because somehow some way people before me did this and they made they made my grandmother my mother they made me so i can keep this this tradition alive i can keep and it is a tradition right i can i can keep this gene pool alive which is the basic biology of the moment um and and it's just there's so much you get from this and there's so much that it feeds me because that ancestral hunger has, has woken up this, this beast in me. I, I, I'm not remembering their history. I wanna remember mine. 
and 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 they and, you know to think about Lucille again. You know, people get mad at me sometimes, but no, like <laughs> and they can stay mad, <laughs> just stay mad, um, because I'm going to keep remembering my history, and my history is now my future with these two little people running around with my genes inside them. And I hope that they'll go on and, and make at least one or two more and keep it going. Um, that's the whole point. But at the same time, it's just like it does, it, it's, it steals you too. Like it, it gives me the spine of steel. If I ever thought I didn't have one, I know that I have one now because I know of all what I'll do in the name of my children. And just even just surviving to have them, to make them to go, and I remember what you were reading about in, in your poem, Edda Phyllis, about giving birth, because it is such a, you know, I keep thinking about Sharon Olds, the, the Boast poem, which is like, I've done this thing. You just kind of want to go around like, look, I did this thing. Like, I made these people. Like, I literally made people, folks. I want you to recognize that. I made people. Um, <laughs> and, but yeah, it just, there's so much you get from parenting. There's so many different ways it can strengthen you. And I think in time, I think it's all in due time because you can't write right away. Some people do. I know I couldn't. I couldn't until they were four. Um, but yeah, just I don't know. Just just to add on, there's just so many ways in which this strengthens you and gives you a perspective. And I appreciate it every which way. Thank you both of you um, for such powerful, powerful thoughts. And I, I, I'd like to close this out with, um, I have become a real staunch soldier, devotee and celebrant in my activism, particularly over the past two years, um, a black joy, right? We know we're resilient. We know we're strength. We know we have to carry on this legacy. You're talking about this ancestral um, strength that we carry on, and yet we still dance, we still create, we still laugh, we still embody beauty and joy. So I would like to ask each of you to share a recent moment of Black joy in your life, or maybe it's a, it, it's a cherished one that's from far back, but I would just, I would love to close out this beautiful Sunday with a with a meditation on on black joy. So anything you'd like to share anything that comes to mind when I ask you that I, I'd love to hear it. Okay. You ready? Um, I, I mean, it's, it's actually when you ask that just like everything floods in like the, the 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 moment of the this morning with the do you want the polar bear super strength power or the do you want the scissors or polar bear super strength power or um um i mean there's just like everything everything actually so much so much i should say not everything so much um but um i will share this morning um my three almost four-year-old daughter um, we were listening to Erica Badu. We were listening to a lot of things, but when Erica Badu came on um, with the roots, she started doing this thing I hadn't seen her do before, where she just was like, she started closing her eyes and she had her hands like this, and she was um, muttering the words, even though she didn't, she didn't know them, but she was saying like, but I was like, oh, she's starting to, um, she's starting to get lost in the music. How exciting. She's starting to like, fly away like this is the beginning of that for her um and it filled me up with with joy that she could um for the getting lost like all the time all the times that that she has that coming you know what i mean um so yeah but so many it's hard to choose it's hard to choose it is true it is hard to choose i have to think and like retrain but there are little things that make me giggle and laugh like my son he's 10 He'll message me in Google messages with just little, little, hi, mommy. Just little messages at weird times, hi, mommy. And it's just, it makes me laugh. And now he's taken to doing it to my sister. And she just, it just makes her giggle too. But he also has taken to handing me things and kneeling down and calling me his queen. And that cracks me up. <laughs> He got it, but uh, like, what am I gonna do? Tell him not to do that? I was like, oh, but he will. He will literally hand me like a glass. Here, my queen, and I'm just like, you are just hilarious. And and my daughter does. I am amazed by her because she's taller than I am. You know, she weighs more than I did when I was her age. Um, 
I was just a wet lick and I'll be the first to tell you. Um, so, um, like, but it just, just to see her strength and also the fact that like she helped me do my hair, you know? And like, so that was, these are the moments that we share and her also, her, so that makes me laugh that she helped me do my hair and she keeps threatening to seal these earrings that I have on. She's like, I'm stealing these mommy. And I'm like, now nah, you 12. Um, <laughs> wait your turn, wait your turn girl, wait your turn. Um, but it's just, it, she is a joy every day. And just cause she's all the things I've rubbed my belly and wished for. I said, I want someone strong. I want someone who won't take no. And while that gives me hell now as a parent, I know she'll give him hell when she gets older and that's what I want. So there's my joy. It's in both those things. Oh, Lisa, you're, you muted, you muted yourself. I muted myself. What I take away from what you both said, just what jumped into my mind, which um, I would like to put out there as like a banner for this week. This is Sunday, right? So a note to start this week on, um, listening to you both what I envisioned was black joy is not a special occasion, right? It's an everyday reality. You know, it's not something precious. It's, it, it, it's not something precious that only happens now and again. It's not the good China to only put on the table, you know, on a holiday, you know what I mean? It's that China on the table on a Wednesday, you know what I mean, on a regular old Wednesday. Um, and so I love, this notion of, of black joy, not only just being, you know, like items of treasure, they are to be treasured, but also just a state of being, right? These things are not mutually exclusive, even though we have, you know, our, our struggles and our trials and tribulations. The joy, the joy is one of, is one of our greatest strengths. And you all have brought the most joy, the most joy to us today. Thank you so much for all of this beauty that you've shared with us. It has been an honor and a pleasure and a pleasure to, to be here with you. Um, so I want to again remind everyone that the links are in the chat for the books and also to make donations to the American Poetry Museum for putting together such beautiful programming as this. Please support um, this organization. Please support artists who are generous with their time and their talent by supporting their work. Like I said, buy a book and get an extra one so that you can pass it on and, uh, and, and share the beauty. Um, the American Poetry Museum is open on Friday from five to seven and Saturday from 10 to three. And they currently have an exhibit on display um, by Francisco Rosario. Um, it's called the Attack Decay Sculpture. And I'd like to thank um, I'd like to thank the museum and for and Sammy Miranda for having us, um, to Pepe and Jay and Timor for being here in, in musical spirit, of course, to Terry and Aracelis for being so generous with their work. And as they have so wisely taught us, um, sending out love to the mothers, to all the mothers who, who birth us in mind and body and spirit and, and give us voice and that you know, even just in our being, as you all said, that we would, that we would be, build houses for them in our creative acts and in our lives, in our simple being. Thank you, thank you so much. This has been, this has been a wonderful, a wonderful treat. Happy thank Sunday, you. everyone. Yes, thank please. Lisa. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for this, just for this time and just for the gift of your words. And thank you, Lisa, for, being such an incredible host, Sammy and American Poetry Museum people support, support, support. Support. And yes. <laughs> this is Click me. that link in the bio, make a donation, buy a book or two or three or four. <laughs> Bless your life. <laughs> this is good energy all the way around. <laughs> Indeed. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. I think we are out of the live stream now. Um, okay. <laughs>